Hi, everybody. I'm Jenna Blum. Welcome to A Mighty Blaze. I'm one of the co-founders of The Blaze, and today I am here with our very, very esteemed and special Friday frontliner guest, Chris Bojalian. Hello, Chris. Welcome back. To Jenna, Friday. how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm better now because I'm looking at you. Cheers. I know we both have our Friday afternoon cocktails. I hope your publisher isn't watching because then they just saw that you had this. Oh, no, my publisher, my publisher is thrilled. I mean, I am way more entertaining when I'm drinking a gin and tonic. Uh, everybody is more entertaining when we are both drinking gin and tonics, right? Like I tell people to drink so that I will be more interesting. So everybody who's joining us, go ahead and make yourself a gin and tonic. Join me and Chris. We are both actually having gin and tonics. And Chris, what is in your gin and tonic that makes it this fetching color? It is a blackberry gin. And it is infused by good friends of mine who actually live a few blocks from you in Boston. Really? Where? Sorry, yeah. we're going to play Boston drinking geography now, everybody. Commonwealth. Okay. okay. All right. I'm I, don't know go the cro I, don't, I don't know the cross street. And I, you know, I don't know if you want to give away you know, your address in Boston. I mean, everyone knows that you live in Boston because of Woodrow on the bench. Um, and so we can <laughs> I, leave it at that. Woodrow on the bench you. being, of course, the most beautiful book ever written about a dog. Okay, this is not why I had Chris on the show today, and I did not pay him to say that about Woodrow, but thank you. Chris and I are both dog parents, and I have questions about that as well. But we are here today to talk about Chris's new novel, The Lioness, which actually is not even out yet, you guys. It's out on May 10th. Make sure to pre-order your copies now. We're going to put tons of links in the chat so you can order at least... 15, 20, maybe 50 copies. Um, but Lioness, even though it is not out yet, has already been optioned for a series, which I will ask about. But first, let me just welcome Chris properly to The Blaze, and let me welcome you all properly to The Blaze as well. Those of you who may be joining us for the first time, we are a team of 35 creative professional volunteers dedicated to link linking writers and readers in the age of COVID, of Delta, of Omicron, of Zelda, of whatever is coming in the pandemic pandemic, after the pandemic, endemic, whatever, um, we are here for you to bring your favorite writers into your living rooms. If you like what you see here, give us a like or a follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We are ubiquitous and sign up for our newsletter at www.mightyblaze.com so you have no mo literary FOMO, nobody likes FOMO. Chris Bajalian. All of you watching, I know, already know who Chris is, but I have to give him his props, even though he said, keep the bio short. Like his bio is actually like, four pages long on my screen. So I'm gonna try and condense this just like off the top of my head. This is your 25th book, am I right? 23rd. 23rd, I'm a novelist, I make ish up. So 23rd book, but okay, 23 books. Some of you may have heard of Chris's other books, just perhaps like The Sandcastle Girls or Midwives, which was a play. Um, that Chris adapted himself, I believe, is that right? And was also a yes. like, tech. So that was like big boom explosion. Um, also, like, I'm, I'm not going to go do all the books. If you are a boom explosion, my friend, I can go just for the last four books, which I loved. And then you'll have to go to chrisbajalian.com to see all the books. But Red Lotus, loved it. Flight Attendant, now a series on HBO Max in the second season just dropped this week. And I can tell you myself personally, that Chris, I saved the first season for after I had surgery to sort of pull me through and it was better than Percocet. Like I just watched this thing watching Casey Cuoco just saying like, she's fantastic. I aspire to be her except a little bit less drunk. Um, and Hour of the Witch, which before The Lioness was Chris's most recent book. I loved Hour of the Witch. I am historical fiction maven as well as author. And I heard it on audio, narrated by Chris's incredibly talented actor-daughter Grace experience. Um, and I was so riveted that I was driving back from Connecticut and I missed my exit and had to drive up, up to New Hampshire. So, I mean, literally that happened. Um, and now we're here to talk about Chris's new book, The Lioness. So, Chris, again, hearty as Thanks, well. Janet. So glad you are here. Tell us about The Lioness. This is the first question I always mm -hmm. ask our esteemed authors. Describe for us in your own word what the lioness is about. The lioness is Evelyn Hugo meets Jurassic Park, or the Poisonwood Bible meets, and then there were none. It's an historical thriller set in 1964. Hollywood's biggest star finally gets married, 
and decides to bring her entire entourage with her into the Serengeti on a honeymoon safari where it all goes to hell fast. And it's really clear that they're all either going to be killed or eaten. And everything that the animals do in this novel are things that I witnessed on safari, except when they are devouring human beings. It had its origins in the summer of 2019. I was in New York City because we were workshopping my adaptation of Midwives, and I went to a matinee, a movie matinee. And when I emerged into the cerulean blue sky, the sun, it's August, I thought to myself, damn, I love movies. Why have I never written a Hollywood novel? And so I did. Mm, that is fantastic. You just knocked out like five of my questions, for which I am grateful. And you will be too, because I always want to ask what the genesis of a novel is, what the origin story is. Also, those of you who have not noticed this aspect of Chris's books, I tweeted this at him, that every time I read a Chris Bajalian book, I learn a new word. And your use of the word cerulean, which is actually one of my favorite words, just reminded me of that. But the pages are always all dog-eared because I'm always folding up the pages that are teaching me things I do not know. So thank you. Your attention to language is chef kiss. Right back at you. I could do this. I could say the same about your books. Well, thank you. That's also he's obviously extremely kind, like one of the kindest people on the planet. So um, talk to me a little bit about the research. I know that you have been on safari, but most of The Lioness was written during the pandemic, yes? Were you reliant on memories or, yeah. or photos and video you saw earlier? Tell me what that was like. Yeah, you know, first of all, the Hollywood portion. Mm. I'm of a generation where people just a little bit older than me their first movie they ever saw was Mary Poppins. Dick Van Dyke, Julie Andrews, Dancing Penguins. Not me. My parents had no filter and they were gonna take me to whatever movie they wanted to see. So the very first movie I ever saw was Bonnie and Clyde. So the very first thing I ever saw in a movie theater is Faye Dunaway Naked and my principal memory of that movie is Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway being machine gunned in the infamous Bonnie and Clyde death car. There's a reason why my books are the way they are. So I knew I wanted to write about one of Hollywood's golden ages. And I thought, let's go to my childhood. So a lot of the research, to go back to your question, was about Hollywood. What was Hollywood like in the 1950s and the 1960s? And I had the best time with the Hollywood fan magazines, which were imagine, imagine if you had a monthly print version of Twitter. I mean, we are talking unbelievable Hollywood snark. And it was mm. fascinating. Mm. So that was half the research. The mm. other half of the research was yes, the Serengeti. And what was East Africa like in the 1960s? And yes, I was able, my, my lovely bride, Victoria Bluer, and I were able to get on a safari in the autumn of 2019, just before the world would shut down for COVID. And we spent two weeks and it was everything you want in a really glorious, glamorous safari, because that's what I wanted to research for this book. Also, if you're going to put me in a tent, it better have a bed. So. <laughs> I was going to ask if you were glamping. I was hoping you no, were glamping. No, I'm not a camper. Oh, I am a glamper. Oh, yeah, I was glamping. No, quite. Yeah, I was glamping. I mean, you know, we, there's no electricity, um, but it's still pretty darn glamorous. It was, it was, so we spent two weeks and that was critical. But then the pandemic hits and I was mostly really fortunate because I was here in Vermont. And this book, writing it, helped keep me sane because we're living in quarantine. We're living in lockdown. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Now a million Americans have died. It's devastating. I mean, and, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff going on. The last time, for those of you watching, that Jenna and I spoke on A Mighty Blaze was, wait for it, January 6th. 
2021. Mm -hmm. Before we went on, we were going back and forth. Okay, do we go ahead to talk about books in the midst of an insurrection? Do we go mm -hmm. ahead and talk about books while the Capitol is being stormed? How do we deal? So there's a lot of stuff going on. And writing The Lioness was a salve. It was a bomb because it's 1964. It's a different world. And B, I'm writing about one of the most beautiful places on earth. The Serengeti is just gorgeous. It is transformative. And being there is just one of the great gifts. And writing about it helped keep me sane. I was going to ask you if this was a sort of form of armchair travel for you um, and what the most memorable moments of that was. I actually, I just want to tell our viewing audience, I'm having a bit of an electrical emergency in my apartment um, during this interview. So I'm going to ask you that question and have our um, on-air interviewer, Julie, step in for me just for a moment while I go talk to the electrician and I'll be right back. But Chris, this makes so much sense to me that there is such a high voltage energy in the lioness, like no, well, actually pun very much intended um, because there is so much that went into it, like a previous experience in 2019. And then um, you've written very beautifully and extensively about what it's like to try and cope emotionally with the pandemic while writing this book and so on. So I'm gonna just hand this off to Julie. Julie, if you wanna come in for a second, just take over. Hi, me. Julie. Hi, um, Julie just did her interview for us today um, but if you guys would chat for a moment about the safari and don't say anything that I desperately need to hear like right away but I want to know like what the most memorable moment of that was and what of that book was incorporated into the lioness and I will be right back gotcha okay okay so there were a lot there were a lot of memorable moments um literally everything that that the animals do in this novel except eating human beings are things we witnessed. My favorite moments certainly included watching the mass crossing of the Mara River by thousands of wildebeest and zebras. It is frantic because they're storming across the Mara River as part of the Great Migration, hoping not to be pulled underwater by a crocodile or eaten on the southern side by a lioness and circle of life. We witnessed all of that. We witnessed wildebeest taken down by crocodiles. We witnessed wildebeest taken down by lionesses. Not lions, lionesses, because, and that's one of the reasons why this book is called The Lioness. Right. Yes. The lioness does most of the hunting. But there are also really lovely, sweet moments that are in the book, such as when the mother elephant herds her young one in front of the cameras with something like pride or the vision of dozens of giraffes pacing or the leopard cubs playing with their mom those are just really really lovely moments and then there are the moments that are really quiet when a storm comes in and goes and you stand and realize for the first time in your life you're seeing a rainbow that literally goes from horizon to horizon. It's not half a rainbow. It's literally a full protractor, a complete rainbow. And then of course, I savored talking to the guides because you know, whether you are in the Serengeti or you're in Yellowstone, the sort of human being who becomes a guide loves the topography, loves the area and i had a great time with the guides not simply asking them the usual questions but because of the kind of book i knew i was going to write asking them all the ways to die in the serengeti and all of the animals and plants that can kill you wow okay i know jen is back but i'm here so i have a follow-up question which is you sound like you were completely immersed in the experience as a human, um, but also as a writer. And I'm just wondering if you took notes or how did you keep those moments alive for yourself for later, for when you would be writing about it? iPhone. I took 
so many videos, so many photos. And yes, I did take notes, but a lot of the notes I took were dictated into my phone or typed into my phone. Also, it really helps to be married to Victoria Bloor, who is a brilliant photographer because her photographs were just astonishing. And when I was writing this book, they were such a gift because I would think to myself, okay, what was that moment like when the giraffes were drinking at the watering hole? How splayed were their legs? And I just look at one of her photographs and say, that's what it was. Amazing. Um, I'll go back to producing and chatting and talking to our people and let you guys get back to conversation. But thank you for letting me ask that question. Oh, oh thank God. you. you now I'm going to miss, I miss Julie. Like I love having her on screen, but now I have you all to myself again, which is amazing. Um, so we, I had been stalking your photos on Instagram. And again, those of you who are not on <clears throat> Chris's Instagram, you can not only see photos about the lioness, including some of Victoria's masterwork um, about their safari, but also Chris's current life, which um, hopefully will soon include tour, but also includes biking around beautiful Vermont and shouting out every library he stops at. So Chris's Insta is always a form for me of my own armchair travel. And also it sounds like a great documentation of research. So I have um, a, a many writer fangirl questions now. And the first one is the lioness is told from many, many points of view, like kaleidoscopic points of view. And we all know from being your fan that you are a master of telling a book from different points of view. The flight attendant told from different points of view, like our which actually was not told from different points of view, but many of your books are. And yet this book has a cast list in the beginning or like the guests who are on the safari and each of these people gets a sort of a colored wedge in that kaleidoscopic point of view. I want to know as an author, how in God's name did you keep them all straight? And do you have an outline and what did this all look like? Yep, great questions, all of them. First of all, I never had trouble keeping them straight and I hope readers don't either, but to make it seamless for readers so they can just be immersed in the experience, every chapter begins with two things. First of all, the name of the character who's featured in the chapter, and secondly, an excerpt from a fictional Hollywood fan magazine or the LA Times reminding you who that character is. Um, secondly, exactly as you said, almost like a play, or um, <clears throat> yeah, like almost like a play, you begin with a cast of characters. In this case, it is the safari manifest. Who are the couples? Who are the singles? Who are the guides? Who are the porters? And there are 11 principal characters, Africans, Americans, women, men. And it's really interesting because the first 11 chapters are from each character's perspective. But as they are killed, or eaten, you know, you, you get to see, you know, the chapters, instead of it being, you know, 11 chapters with 11 characters, then it's, you know, 10 chapters with 10 characters. And, you know, by the time you're done, it's, you know, pick a number, three chapters with three characters. And then there were not, although, no, I, I shouldn't say that. I'm not giving no, and away. Then there were, and then there were, that, as I said, that was an inspiration. Imagine mm -hmm. the Poisonwood Bible meets, and then there were none. This is, this is a thriller. And yeah. not everyone's going to get out alive. Mm -hmm. it's, and that is actually one of my favorite aspects about fiction, is when you take a situation that is organically interesting, like a group of Hollywood people goes on safari with a group of African people who are in charge of taking care of them, that is automatically glamour. It's automatically taking you to a beautiful place. And then you throw sort of a disaster into the mix, and boom, again, sort of a boomtastic thing happens. I love me a good disaster novel, even if this is a man-made disaster. Our friend Jody Picot also referenced Agatha Christie describing the lioness. She said it's like a combination of Hemingway, like the Macomber oh. um, story, and Agatha Christie. And I thought that was apt, but also like meets, I don't know, Bel Canto because of the man-made nature of this disaster. And then there's the combination of like human violence and wildlife violence. And so I just thought it was this fantastic maelstrom of, 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 
like a perfect storm of a plot. When you started I had saying- never, I, had never thought, I had never thought of Bel Canto. What an interesting comp that is and so smart. Oh, thank you. Well, I loved Bel Canto. Who did not love Bel Canto? Who does not love Ann Patchett, right? But I feel as though you take a group of people, you endear them to your reader, and then you put them through the sort of Plato factory of you know violence and coming from every direction. Who comes out alive? That's what we want to know, and we are so invested. And then you also have Africa as a character, as this very vibrant um, setting that is interacting with the characters. And so I just thought it was like this beautiful thing. So I wanted to ask you, because it is described by the New York Times as a historical thriller. Do you consider it, you said historical thriller yourself many times now, but do you think of it as a thriller first, as a historical novel first, as a character portraiture? How did you talk to yourself about it when you were writing it? But that is such a good question. Um, my books have changed a lot in the years I've been mm -hmm. writing. And that's in part because of streaming television. I mm -hmm. love TV. Breaking Bad, <laughs> The Sopranos, Mad Men, The Wire. They all changed how I write. So a book like The Flight Attendant, or Hour of the Witch, or The Lioness, while they might be literary fiction, they now have a thriller bent to them. It might be a slow burn. I mean, I'm always fascinated when people talk about the flight attendant as a thriller, because that's a book that I viewed as a character study of two women that happen to have certain thriller tropes. The Lioness, I view fundamentally, I think, as historical fiction, where a lot of people get whacked. <laughs> Which is a very Sopranos term as somebody who yeah. grew up in Jersey and drove through all the settings of the Sopranos in her in her youth, in her glorious youth. Um, yeah, a lot of people get whacked in this, but they get whacked by a number of different causes. You should definitely read it. That is so fascinating to me because one of the things that I love about your books, I'm just gonna fangirl here for another minute, so have another- Thank you. Time but it's all very genuine fangirling, so drink up while I talk. Um, there are very few authors, I think, who can accomplish the task that you do, which is to put out a book almost like once a year, like maybe every year and a half, maybe two years, yeah. but really it, it seems like more. And they do have that sweet spot of character development and portraiture. Like you believe these are actual real people. They're not um, just chalk outlines kind of dropped into a plot. But they also have a plot that is propulsive and that drives the whole thing and that really keeps us reading. And there's that attention to language that I mentioned earlier that is, you know, I would say it's cerulean, but that's actually not an apt description of it. But it's just this very rich stew of character development and plot and language. And yet you turn these books out so quickly. So how? is my question. And do you start, actually, I'm asking you two questions, which is a terrible thing to do. Um, but yeah, do you okay. start with character first, with plot spark first? Um, do you ever wake up and have a line in your head and think, oh, language first? Is it different for every book? I All I need to begin is a premise. And whether it's first person or third person, that's really all mm -hmm. I need to know. In this case, Hollywood star goes on a safari and it all goes to hell. Flight attendant wakes up next to a dead body far from home. Functional alcoholic has no idea what happened. Um, first divorce in North America for domestic violence. That's really all I know when I begin a book. I have no outline. I have no idea how it's going to end. And the lioness mm -hmm. was no exception. All I knew was quite literally, Hollywood's biggest star goes to Africa. What happens next? And um, I then just let the characters take me by the hand and lead me through the dark of the story. And it's really fun for me that way. I mean, tell me, do you, when, when you're, okay, let's put Woodrow aside for a moment. When you're writing a novel, do you have an outline or are you sort of letting your characters lead you? 
oh, my characters are way too unruly to for me to let me lead them. And I'm also too OCD. I have not only one outline, but 11 outlines usually per book. I start with an outline that is mostly uh, question marks and WTFs because I'm not sure exactly what's going to go in each scene, but I know the beginning, the end, maybe a couple midpoints, and then um, the premise, as you said, or the th- like what I want to express with this. And then as I write into the book and and try scenes out, sort of test drive them, you know, throw the spaghetti at the wall that way, a lot of those question marks get replaced with what the scene actually was. And then I replace the outline with a new outline that shows how much more I've discovered. So by the end of every book, I have about 11 outlines and about 800 pages of cutting room floor material, which is why I put out a book every five to 10 years and you put out a book every year, maybe <laughs> it sounds like you're doing a much, a much better job with the, with the characters. But I mean, but you know, there, 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 there is no award no. in literature for quantity. I mean, my, my God, how many books did Tolstoy publish? How many books has Donna Tartt published? Oh, and they're great. Yes. And Margaret Mitchell, for that matter, although she is like currently not in vogue, but she published one book, Harper Lee, one book, right? So, and I'm also really fascinated with what you said about your writing changing over time. And as somebody who has been reading your books for years, you know, as many books, as many books and years as you've been writing, I see the change and it's so interesting. But a lot of times I think what happens with authors who start out you know with the literary fiction and then they get very popular and and their publishers demand them to put out books faster and faster to me their books become almost translucent they become shorter and shorter there's less and less character development less attention to language the plots are still propulsive but the plot almost takes precedence over what was so beautiful and rich about the books before there are a couple of authors who are an exception to that you are one of those authors and i think Thank also you. You're welcome. I mean, this genuinely, I wouldn't have said this, but I think T.C. Boyle also is like he puts out books quickly and they still have the same heft and the same amount of juice in them and the same attention to all the things you want to pay attention to as an author. Um, And yet you're right. I think that your books have shifted over time. And I wasn't thinking maybe it was because of the love of series and what that now allows us to do. Like in the olden days, you'd have a book that got made into a movie. That's it, right? So you could write a book that would be then shrunk down to 120 pages. Now a book can be developed into a series, which I think is a much better model for yep. um, adaptation, right? So can you talk a little bit about the intersectionality of series availability as, as an adaptation and your own writing process? Like how did this shift your writing from your early um, like the literary fiction that would be adapted for screen. Um, to- I'm going to answer that question, but I'm going to let Jesse out of my library because my lovely bride just got home and Jesse wants to go say hi. I saw her walking around. We saw you guys, we got to see Victoria a little bit in the background. Which is actually this sort of like beautiful film like effect, almost a sort of Hitchcock effect of her walking behind you. So I didn't want to tell you that, but it was like, this is cool, man. Um, and we would like to see Jesse at the end, please. If, if okay. Victoria relinquished Jesse, that would be amazing. Yep. Um, yeah. so, the in, so, so the intersection of series, hmm. yeah, the intersection of series and the book. Um, <clears throat> I love, love what Steve Yawkey did with season one of The Flight Attendant. I just love the way he adapted the novel. Um, I love the way he understands that you can do things on the screen you might not do on the page. And there are things we want in our books that we don't want on the screen. Um, It's a real tightrope that that he's just brilliant at. So when I'm writing a book, I'm not thinking, oh gosh, this needs to happen so it can become a TV series. Never, 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 never. The book for me is a standalone um, piece of art. And if it becomes a TV series, that's fantastic and I'm thrilled. Or if it becomes a film, I'm thrilled. But when I am writing the book, I know that in my head, I'm thinking about what do I love in television? What do I love in books? that's different now than 20 years ago. So um, a case in point with a flight attendant, if I had written the flight attendant 
20 years ago, it would not have begun with a flight attendant waking up in bed next to a dead body, unsure of whether she killed him or not. It likely would have begun with her becoming a flight attendant, her training, or it might have begun with the fact she's an alcoholic and her drinking somewhere. Mm -hmm. But because mm -hmm. of how TV impacts mm -hmm. us differently, um, I write differently. One of my favorite, favorite shows of the last two years is Yellow Jackets. Um, mm -hmm. Christina Ricci, Juliet Lewis, an ensemble of amazing young actors about a high school soccer team, plane crash, they're in the wilderness, and now they're grown-ups, and cannibalism is the least horrible thing that happens. It's great. So, um, I am thrilled that some of the, you know, the, P, the E1, which is the studio behind Yellow Jackets, will be the studio behind The Lioness. And I'm just thrilled about that because it's it's an indication of where our, our sensibilities are so in sync. Mm -hmm. Yes, that I can see how that would be incredibly satisfying because I imagine people often ask me when I was out on the road in the olden days, when you're out in person, um, do you want your book to be made into a movie? And I, it could have been a very short answer because I could have said, yes, of course, like who doesn't want her book to be made? In, why would you not want that? And yet when your book is optioned to become a film, when it's optioned to become a series, you do relinquish the autocratic control that a novelist has to create a world, oh, yeah. to create images in the minds of the reader to like, when I write, I basically am aspiring to mind control. I want the reader to see, feel, hear, smell, like, you know, touch everything that that character is. And, and have them have the same experience that I am having in the writing of entering that character and that character's experience. When you have a book made for screen, you're then working with a team. Can you talk about what that transition has been like for you? Yes, in my experience, it's been super easy. I've had three books become movies, one book become a TV series, and my involvement has ranged from trying to stay out of the way on the set to eating a lot of bagels from craft services. I imagine, I actually have a lot of movie being made in my neighborhood right now. And every day Henry and I walk past the craft table, the craft services table and Henry's like, I would like to have some of those cold cuts and also yeah. donuts and also it's like very high carb. And then all of the stars, all of the talent is like size nothing and they're much smaller than you think. So- yeah. um, no, 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 some of some, and I do some TV projects in development where I will be writing or I will be more involved. But so far, my involvement has principally been, thank you, Hollywood. <laughs> Absolutely. And do you have, I hope this is okay to ask, but do you have like consultant credit? Do you get producer credit? How do you negotiate these things for all the writers who are watching? We all want to know because we all aspire to be you basically. Yep. Um, don't ever aspire to be me. Trust me, um, there is the path to madness. Um, <laughs> I, uh, um, I am an executive. Pro I am an executive producer on the Lioness. Um, I will be an executive producer um, and creator on another project, which I hate to be coy, but I can't announce right now. That is fetching. And then um, do you aspire also to be involved with the writing, to work in a writer's room, to work with a showrunner um, on one of your own books? I never want to be in a writer's room. You used the word autocratic control of your characters. The only time an autocracy is good is when you're a novelist. I loved what you said Amen. about that. So um, I'm not built to be in a writer's room in LA, um, but I'll give you an example. It hasn't happened and it may never happen, but Lou Diamond Phillips and I have been working for a couple of years on my novel Skeletons at the Feast. And Lou is not simply an amazing actor, an amazing director. He is a friggin' spectacular 
writer. Um, you know, I mean, he's even a novelist for the Tinderbox. He's just great. And the way we worked on that is we quite literally divided it up. Mm. You know, he wrote episode one. I wrote episode two. He wrote episode three. I wrote episode four. And we would send the episodes back and forth for each other to tweak. And of course, you know, we always would write the episode with, you know, a bunch of index cards and notes about what from the novel must be in this episode. What do we need to do here? Now, I don't know if this will ever happen, you know, who knows, but that's how I like, I like that process a lot. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Do you think you'd be able to collaborate that well with everybody or is it just working with Mr. Phillips that is? I think, Mr. Phil I think Mr. Phillips would say you must call me Lou because he he's also been the comforter in chief for hundreds of thousands of people on Twitter for the last two or three years. You know, as the world is melting down, there's always Lou. And his lovely bride, Yvonne Phillips, does the same thing on Instagram. It's just just glorious. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, Steve. I found there are the other people I found I can write with really well. That is encouraging for somebody who also likes to retain autocratic control of own creative impulses. And yet I think it's so inspiring to see authors make those inroads into other forms of uh, expression, I guess, of story expression. I'm, I'm a TV child. Also, I grew up on TV. My dad was a TV producer and news writer. And so I've always I didn't know that. Yeah, he worked for CBS. This is partly why I'm like I'm so activist because he wrote for Cronkite and Harry Reasoner and Dan Rather, and so I grew up in a newsroom. Um, as much as I could like bludgeon my way in there, I was there with him. So um, I am a great uh, fan of the visual story, and I think it's such a valid way to write. Do you think like what is the intersectionality also of time for you because I now see and maybe I'm miss seeing this because I see it mostly on social media but I see you coming out with these fantastic books like every year every year and a half or so um, and they all have their integrity and they all have their drama and they are all heartily welcomed by all of us and then I also see so much of the activity that is Hollywood related that's flight attendant related that's lioness related um, I imagine that those two things are fused in some way, but also that they're contradictory in some way in terms of their demands on your time. And I might add, you have a damn good social media game. And as somebody who also is a social media maven, that is no small thing. Like that takes time, attention and effort. So how do you handle all of this? You know, um, thank you. But first of all, Instagram in some ways is a novel. One of the things that I, I actually wrote about this for the Boston Globe in December is at one point in 2021, I saw two friends of mine in New York City for the first time in 15 months. And if you looked at our Instagram feeds, we were fine. We were getting through the pandemic just fine. But as the morning cappuccinos were replaced by morning mimosas and then harder drinks, the truth came out. We were all a mess. We were all broken. So when you look at my Instagram feed, you know, you see a great, fantastic life. And I, I lead a great, fantastic life. I'm married to the most wonderful woman on the planet. We've got the most amazing daughter on the planet. You know, I live in Vermont most of the time, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff you don't see on Instagram, such as this. My voice is a pandemic casualty. Um, it's better now than it was, but it's never going to recover. I lost it in March of 2020, just before the world shut down. It was perfect on Friday, March 13th, 2020. And it was gone a few weeks later, just gone. And it's really interesting to run a social media game, to be a novelist, to be a human being, when suddenly you can't speak. Mm. It's just, mm. there's no voice. Now, my voice therapist, is great. And I've had a lot. I think I've seen 
eight ENTs in four states and who knows how many voice therapists. And the, the one I've glommed onto is a former Israeli forces special commando. And when we were working together at one point, she said to me, Chris Bojelian, I have watched so many videos of you before you lose voice, after you lose voice, you talk about is somatic reaction to grief. First of all, I tell you this, you do not know grief. I did my homework on you. In 1973, you are a little boy playing the little league baseball in Connecticut. Me, my beloved fiance is killed in battle. And what do I do? I follow him right into battle. Secondly, you are not opera singer. This diagnosis I give you is not end of world, is not big deal. Get over yourself. Even when your voice is total bowel movement, <laughs> even when you are all Grandpa Simpson, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, you are a big ham. And I'm going to listen to you because you have interesting things to say. Now, the other thing about this weird, you know, post COVID voice is that neurologically, when I mimic voices, the voice is more clarity. Mm. So sometimes I try to mimic her. And when I was once mimicking her to her, she said, if this makes you happy to imitate me and do my voice, do my voice, but you are a shitty mimic. You don't sound like me. You don't sound like me. You sound like a Russian hooker. <laughs> and she says that like it's a bad thing. Yeah. Right. I know Ellen is saying I actually I, I do a lot of mimicry also. And my favorite person to pay an homage to in this way is my agent, Stephanie Abu, who many of you know is a fabulous, fierce French woman, and she hates it. When I do her accent, she's like Jenna you do this, you talk like this about me and you make me sound like Pepe Le Pew and I do not sound like this. <laughs> I do not, I am so sorry, I'm just doing my best. But I mean, this is how she sounds in my head. I find it so fascinating that if you're mimicking other people's voices, your voices, what is the word? Did you just teach me yet another new word in an interview? A clarited, clarited? No, no, it's more, it has better clarity. Oh, better clarity. Well, let's just make up that word. It is a clarited. There, you heard it here first, people. Um, and Chris, I might, point out that this is a bit of a double-sided coin because if you lost your voice completely, you would still have your writing, which would be your voice. Um, somebody said to me, like, I'm mean, I was going to have surgery on my face and I was worried about looking like I'd had a stroke because that was a possible outcome of the surgery. And she oh, said to God. me, well, it's a good thing you're a writer. And I was like, wrong answer. You need to tell me this isn't going to happen, you know, but it, it is true. I mean, I'm not an on-screen talent. So um, we would still both have our voices. Mm. At the same time, it would be so sad if you lost your voice completely because you were a great mimic. Um, apologies to your Israeli commando therapist who's probably going to come after me now. Um, and also, you're a really good raconteur, and that's not always the case with every writer. So we just we are loving this. Um, I know we have questions from our audience. I could I have so many questions still, like first versus third person, this, that, the other. Um, but maybe we can pop up some of the, the questions on the screen. Sure. Um, I wonder, um, while we're waiting um, for, the, for our audience questions to uh, magically appear, oh, there's a book author inspires you. Um, never mind. I had a question, but fine, audience, just take the mic from me. Is there a book or author who most inspires you? Besides me, obviously. Oh, certainly. I mean, I could talk about Woodrow on the bench. I could talk about your historical fiction. I could talk about those who save us um, for a long time. Because so many of our friends are writers. I'm going to go back in time so I don't hurt anyone's feelings. When I was in eighth grade, my family moved from a suburb of New York City to Miami, Florida, which at the time was a suburb of New York City. And <laughs> I went to see my new orthodontist a sadist it would turn out if ever there was one. And he gave me some orthodontic headgear that looked like the business end of a backhoe. And I had to wear it four hours a day, I couldn't speak. So I would go to the Hialeah Miami Lakes Public Library and I would read. And among the books that I read that have stayed with me, certainly, you know, I'm a middle school kid in the, you know, the mid to late 1970s, 
Stephen King has just started publishing his astonishing grand Gunyel. I read Peter Benchley's Jaws. I read William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist. And I read for the first time Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Joyce Carol Oates's Expensive People. And from those books, I learned so much from, you know, Blatty and Benchley, the importance of linear momentum and narrative drive. And from Harper Lee and Joyce Carol Oates, you know, the fact that a, a first person narrator in a novel is every bit as made up as the fictional constructs mm -hmm. around him or her. Mm -hmm. Love that. And that makes so much sense to me that um, you would pick up things from Benchley and maybe from Stephen King too, who was, I cut my, my childhood teeth on my, my early adolescence. I remember sitting with my back against the radiator in the kitchen and the mom, my mom scolding me to get up and set the table or help her with dinner. And I would be immersed in the stand or Christine or the shining. And I think people are scared of King because he's a horror writer, but he has such a canny grasp of psychology and also of the linear plot momentum momentum that you mentioned that is so crucial if you don't want readers to get bored. So I feel like yeah. a mashup of Harper Lee, Joyce Carol Oates, Benchley, Stephen King, like that is your books because you have the plot and you have the character development and shading that helps us believe that your characters are actually real people. So Sharon from Minnesota, hi Sharon, wants to know why the time frame you picked and I'm assuming the question is about the lioness. So um, you can let yep. me know if that's right. I, it's a great question. I picked the 1960s because it was an era of cultural and social upheaval. It was my childhood. Um, and it was one of Hollywood's golden eras. Mm. The fact is, in the 1960s, we didn't have streaming television. So movie palaces mm. mattered. And, you know, even into, well, gosh, even into, you know, for another 30 years, a movie could get into the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. The Godfather, Bonnie and Clyde, Mary Poppins, all big screen movies. Now, the things in the zeitgeist that come from movies tend to be the superhero movies the Marvel franchises, the Jurassic Park franchises, a movie like Belfast, Kenneth Branagh's beautiful homage to his childhood in Belfast, I loved. But that movie lived and died on the small screen. In 1968, that movie might have been in the zeitgeist through movie theaters. And do you think that series have now taken the place of movies in the zeitgeist, aside from the Marvel superhero movies? I hear people talking about series much more than I do feature I do. films. You're absolutely yeah. right. I do. Um, now, maybe if you and I were 15 years old, that would be different because we'd all want to talk about Spider-Man or Doctor Strange. Um, but for grown-ups, and I don't want to be dismissive of superhero movies because I'm not. And I don't want to be dismissive of adolescence because I'm not. But in the zeitgeist now, yes, it tends to be TV series more and more. People are more likely to be talking about Ozark or Secession around, you know, the water cooler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's how I came to like Yellowstone or like Mayor of East Ham or 1883 or all of the things that I'm watching. And I feel as though we used to have connectivity through the nightly news, right? Like there were three nightly news outlets. Mm -hmm. There was you know, maybe one local newspaper that you might I miss read. that. I know I do too. And I think part of the reason we're in so much trouble politically is that there is such a Tower of Babel effect with news. But there was a sort of connective tissue and this connective webbing around were you watching the Carol Burnett show? Were you watching Walter Cronkite? Were you watching whatever? We all watched and and uh, discussed the same things and got our news from the same sources and it was actual news. Um, and now I feel as though um, the zeitgeist connective tissue that I get coming to me is either it is from social media, but it is all about series. Like it is all about unorthodox, for instance, or whatever. And I, I do love that because I feel as though we are still warming our hands at the same 
communal fire of imagination, even though there are so many options, there are always things that stand out a little bit. The flight attendant is definitely one of the things that comes through. And it's not just because I like stalking you and we're friends and I love to read your books. It's because like, it is like front and center out there. People are watching it. And talking about, yeah. You know, and, and talking yeah. about yeah. Kaylee Cuoco's brilliant, wonderful performance. My gosh, she mm -hmm. is Cassie Bowden. Oh, she's so amazing. I kind of forget that she's an actor, which is probably the highest compliment that you can pay yeah. an actor as well, right? So we're getting like so many, I, we only have you for maybe like five, 10 more minutes, I think. And I still have so many questions. One of them is just about, and again, this comes from sheer envy. So like pig envy, but um, how do you manage to put the books out so fast? Like, can you walk us through or bike us through like a typical Chris Bajalian day? How much do you sure. write? How much do you use social media? My goal is yeah. My goal is to write a thousand words every day. As Jody Pico has said, it's a whole lot easier to edit garbage than a blank page. Mm -hmm. So I just want to get stuff down. And that means like like you, you talked about all the darlings you need to kill. I kill a lot of darlings, but I always move it forward. I write in the mornings. Um, in the winter, I usually start about six or seven in the morning. In the spring and summer, I usually write, start later in the morning because I walk Jesse. Um, and this is really interesting. Well, this is not interesting, except to me. The reason why it changes is because I want to ride my bike and I'm selfish. And so I do the morning walk of Jesse on days I can ride my bike and my lovely bride walks her in the afternoon. In the winter when I'm not gonna ride my bike in Vermont, I get more work done in the mornings because I'm gonna walk her in the afternoon because I like to write in the morning. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's boring at all. I think it answers the question that a lot of writers have. I don't know if the readers who are watching find this interesting, but I do. Like one of the things that I think is challenging about being an author like you have the delight of autocratic control you work for yourself you don't answer to a boss except to your imagination but you also have the challenge of fluctuating time like you have the challenge of fluctuating um how do i put this i guess the, all the moving pieces that comprise the writer's life there's a public part of the writer's life there's the private part there's the part where you just sit in your yoga pants if you're me and just try and channel imaginary people down onto the page and then there's exercise and people you want to see in your life, like your bride or you walk your dog. And how do you how do you put all those things together? And then you have social media and you have Hollywood, which is the part we don't all of us have. So I was curious about the fluctuations and regulations of that system. I'm very disciplined. I mean, I write every day. Literally, I mean, I write Easter. I write Christmas morning. I write every single day. I'm not on tour. And the only reason I don't write on tour is because I'm usually up really early. Like for example, I'm on tour the next two weeks. I've got three wake up calls at three in the morning to catch five or six AM flights to get to the next venue. I've got one day where I've got four planes in a day. And it's going to be such a gift to see readers again in person. I mean, but um, I'm not going to be writing for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that must be a weird thing. Okay, so I'm thinking of this as like we are total opposites with writing because I'm very like, oh, I'm on tour now, so I can't write for like two years. Again, this is why you have literally five times the number of books I have, which it's not a competition, it's just a thing. No. Nope. But the, um, the writing process is so different for every writer. Our friend Pam Jenoff, who I call the general, I call the general because she gets up every morning and writes in this incredibly disciplined way. And when we were on tour for our anthology, Grand Central, we were all in New York together. Sarah McCoy was also Karen White, Erica Roebuck. Like Pam got up and ran up and down the stairs of our hotel, like in the stairwells before she wrote. And I was like, but I'm on tour. I need to get a bagel and then be there for my readers. <laughs> I mean, it's like, right. again, this is probably how you get ish done. Thank you for this lesson. I might have to start getting up a little bit earlier. So we might um, have time for one more audience question. Um, and yes, I, I wanted to ask you about the chocolates that go with the lioness and about your tour. So if you would, oblige us, chocolates. Okay, this is really exciting. My favorite chocolate in the world is Lake Champlain chocolates. And Lake Champlain chocolates has created 
the special lioness chocolate bar using um, East African sourced dark cocoa, um, Ethiopian Burberry spices, um, candied coconut, and they're giving $2 from every chocolate bar to Fair Trade USA to support women in agriculture in Africa. It is this perfect chocolate bar to go with the novel. It's kind of fiery, kind of spicy. Um, so yes, and you can certainly, I will have the chocolate bars with me as swag at all 15 venues in the next two weeks. You can also get them at Lake Champlain Chocolate Stores at some of the bookstores around the country that sell Lake Champlain chocolates. And of course, if you go to lakechamplainchocolates.com, there's a whole page and you can buy just the chocolate bar. You can buy the chocolate bar in a signed book. And each chocolate bar comes with a special lioness bookmark. Oh my God, I totally love it. And the only thing that's missing is like the sound of you, like when you open the bag going, <laughs> something like that. Can, can you do that? For, um, so tell us, um, just remind us again, like where can readers buy, because I'm seeing a lot of comments in our chat about where we can buy the signed lioness and get the chocolate. It's all about the chocolate and the lioness together. So Lake Champlain, Champlain, excuse me, that's where my brain is, Champlain. Champlain chocolates, you can get the actual chocolate bar. Tell us your favorite bookstore to buy from, please. Um, there are so many bookstores that I love, but I will tell you that mm -hmm. five miles from my house is the Vermont bookshop where Robert Frost used to browse and the chair where he would sit is still there. And if you order the lioness through the Vermont bookshop, through you know a mighty blaze and all of your you know your links before midnight tonight, I will personalize it, not just sign it, personalize it before I go on tour. If you want merely a regular signed books, they are everywhere. Oh my goodness gracious. I signed so many thousands and thousands and thousands of books um, earlier this spring. Your bookstore might have them. And of course, I am on tour at, and you can find it all at chrisbojellion.com events, but I'm on at 15 stores or off sites in all four time zones between Vermont and San Diego. Oh my gosh, that is amazing. Well, we will stalk you in person and online. We will order the chocolate, we'll order the books. People, you heard it here first. If you order from Vermont Bookstore before midnight tonight, you can get your lioness personalized. Also, I think this makes a great Mother's Day gift. If your mom likes to read about people being eaten, which like who doesn't, and also chocolate, like here you go. You can order like 20 of these for your mom and you'll have gifts for her for the next 20 years. Chris, I have a question about the chocolate though. Are you carrying yes. chocolate bars with you on tour? And are you no. going somewhere warm? Are you going to have like chocolate soup in your bag? Without wanting to bore you with the logistics, <laughs> um, I'm having them shipped to the different stores to wait okay. for me. Okay, because I'm picturing this sort of like Willy Wonka effect where you show up with like this carpet bag full of fantastic, you know, lioness chocolate bars and open it and it's like a delicious soup, which I would still yeah. eat, but you know. Yeah. Okay, see, this is the kind of thing people like to know about author life. Like, do you have to carry your own chocolate? No, you do not. You don't, no. One last thing I will tell you. If you happen to buy the Barnes & Noble exclusive edition, it has photos from the safari. Oh, oh my God, that is amazing. Okay, so one of the things that I love about Chris, one of many things, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm hoarse with love, is that he is a magician when it comes to marketing and swag. And people who love marketing like me are just watching with like the greatest admiration that you make it look so easy. You bring the magic, not only in the books, but around the books and generate these great, this great excitement. You generate chocolate for us. You generate these photos Victoria took, right? Just fantastic stuff. So like, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being with us even before your book is published to share the magic of the lioness with us. We are so grateful and we can't wait to see it. Roar. I, I love doing this. May 10th, people, May 10th, and buy it today from the Vermont Bookshop. Chris, Jenna, thank you. Thank you, Jenna, thank you for having me on. Thank you and Carolyn Levitt 
for founding a mighty blaze two years ago, which has been a great gift to readers and writers. You rock. And while you're getting my books, make sure you get Jenna's books. Okay, I'll take that. And now Stephanie is like, Chris, thank you so much. I am going to send you some champagne and chocolate that you need. So thank you. All right, you guys. Be well, and I'll see you at 7 p.m. actually tonight for Sarah McCoy, and I will have had several more gin and tonics, so I will be even more entertaining if possible. Chris. Mystique Island, Sarah McCoy. Make sure yeah. you get that book too. Yes, oh my God, I love you. You're so great. All right, we're gonna go love fest in the green room. Bye y'all, happy reading. Bye everybody, bye.